Welcome everybody to what I understand is, is the final talk of our semester. So this is very uh, exciting. Um, I am uh, supremely honored to be introducing Harsha Walia, um, who is an organizer and public intellectual based in Vancouver in Coast Salish territories. She's been a leader and supporter of a number of organizations and movements, including No One is Illegal in um, both Montreal and Vancouver, the Downtown Eastside Women's Center in Vancouver, February 14th Annual Women's Memorial March, and um, First Nations Land Defense. She's also actively involved in organizing with the South Asian community where she lives. Through this work, Harsha has been central to conversations about what migrant justice means in settler colonial contexts, and how colonialism and racial capitalism are at the root of displacement, criminalization of migration, and nation state boundary enforcement. She's spoken at countless rallies, protests, convenings, uh, multiple interviews. If you Google her, you'll find an interview in print or <laughs> in print or uh, on YouTube. She tweets fairly prolifically um, and is the author of two really important books, Undoing Border Imperialism from AK Press and Border and Roll, which just came out this past year from Haymarket. Border imperialism as a concept has crossed over into academic geography, Canadian studies, crit critical ethnic studies, because it offers such a powerful account of how transnational capitalism's twin processes of displacement and exploitation are systematically linked to racialized practices of border fortification and criminalization of people on the move. I view and teach the book as a feminist text that includes work by multiple organizer intellectuals with whom she works and foregrounds processes of collective theorization and meaning making. Evident in Walia's texts and interviews as a dialectic of theorizing from the ground and study, deep study, to inform ongoing struggles, out of which comes evolved theory and so on. Walia's work theorizes a cross difference with specificity. There is not a singular migrant subject or indigenous subject, but specific articulations of groups of people. So one can read, um, read this organizing process of building solidarity and relationships within um, undoing border imperialism and border and rule. So what does it mean for asylum seekers or people whom the state does not authorize to be in a territory to also act in solidarity with First Nations? Um, how are struggles for freedom of movement tied to projects of dismantling settler sovereignties? So border and rule, her most recent text, busts through the frame of the nation state to show how both state categories like migrant and citizen structure terms of inclusion and exploitation under racial capitalism. And it shows how a transnational movement might emerge from the terrors of racist nationalisms to dismantle racial capitalism and settler societies. It is the kind of uh, Grumpian, Stuart Hollyan conjunctural analysis that we need now and so without further ado, um, thank you, Harsha Walia, for um, sharing your work with us and your time with us today. Thank you so much, Jenna, for that generous introduction and welcome. Thank you, everyone involved in organizing, Adrian, Peter, and everyone else for having me. I'm so honored to be here with all of you. And thank you all for sharing your time here today. Um, I know there's a lot of Zoom fatigue going around, so. Uh, I don't take for granted that you all have chosen to spend your time together here in this space. So thank you for the generosity of your time. Um, I'm on unceded Coast Salish territories, which are the land of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Skohomish nations who continue to steward these lands and who continue to assert their jurisdiction on these lands. And I offer that um, not as a, you know, a simple or token land acknowledgement, but to really ground us in an understanding that when we're thinking about borders, particularly settler colonial borders in places like the United States or Canada, where I'm based, that those borders are cleaved and carved on top of indigenous nations and indigenous notions of land stewardship, of placemaking, of belonging, 
um, and of, of legal orders and social orders uh, that have been annihilated through settler colonial genocide. Um, and I, I will be talking more about that, but that really is such an important place to start and to, to continue a conversation about borders. Um, and what I want to say about borders is, you know, I'm hoping to not go into too much detail um, about why borders are bad, um, but really to have that as, as the starting point of my talk and to think through more deeply and spend most of my time uh, in conversation with you all about thinking more deeply about what borders really are and what work do they do and what function do they serve um, in our in our contemporary context. Um, so, you know, I want to say that this talk isn't really about, though, of course, is in support of um, campaigns that are to abolish ICE or to abolish detention centers, um, whether they, you know, all detention centers, but really more deeply than that to interrogate the entire structure of border control um, and of borders, which I would argue are foundationally constructed to maintain social violence and control. And even more so, borders are a modality central not only to social control, but to eugenicist population ordering, which we see, for example, in the United States, to an unbroken line of racial exclusion through the centuries, vagrancy laws deporting the poor or those deemed criminal, laws excluding single women migrants deemed to be sex workers, attacks on labor unionism through the expulsion of communists and anarchists dating back to the Palmer raids, sodomy laws and bars on queer and trans migrants and medical examination as a basis for excluding disabled migrants. So the ways in which the border both produces and organizes social difference is at the heart of bordering regimes, which make both the so-called good versus bad immigrant, but also maintain the colonial, racial, gendered, sexualized, ableist, and classist orderings amongst all even so-called legal citizens. So in that way, uh, the border is so much more, and I'll keep returning to this, the border is so much more than a line on the map. The border is so much more than the markings of so-called state territorial sovereignty, but bordering regimes are a key pillar of the organization of social difference and the reproduction of social difference and social hierarchies. Today, more than ever, the border is a central site of struggle as a linchpin amongst resurgent white nationalist, anti-trans and xenophobic fascism. Far-right appeals target so-called foreigners for stealing our jobs, draining our services, ruining our environment, infecting our neighborhood and tainting our values, or so we're told. These kinds of refrains from the far right deflect responsibility from the underlying socioeconomic systems that produce mass inequality, impoverishment, and misery by conveniently scapegoating migrants and buttressing moral panics about securing the border. Our responses to such far right drivel cannot be liberal or neoliberal, moralizing about how good immigrants are or how much immigrants contribute to the economy or to our society, or platitudes about shallow multiculturalism. Instead, we need a rigorous analysis of the border itself. And more than anything, we need to remember at this time of heightened austerity and in the midst of a global pandemic, that our enemy arrives in a limousine and not on a boat. This is especially true with the climate crisis increasingly linked to the migration crisis. In France, Marine Le Pen, for example, who is a far-right politician, is making a comeback in some progressive circles with her new screed of, quote, borders are the environment's greatest ally. It is through them that we will save the planet, end quote. Borders are at the heart of growing eco-fascist movements, which again makes it so vital to interrogate the nature of borders and the politics of bordering. The Southern US border which is the US-Mexico border, is so illustrative in terms of thinking about border formation and border function today. Border controls are often seen as a, quote, migrant justice issue, a kind of single siloed issue that is separate from anti-imperialist struggle, separate from Black liberation, or separate from indigenous decolonization struggles. Nothing could be further from the truth. Here, I would point to the work of Audra Simpson, Shannon Speed, Robin Maynard, Kelly Hernandez, Black Alliance for Just Migration, the Red Nation, Jenna Lloyd's work, and so many others. U.S. bordering practices were in fact conceived of as a method of imperialist conquest, eliminating indigenous people and controlling black people. 
Often we think of the border as a kind of domestic issue that is separate from global politics. But again, using the example of the U.S.-Mexico border, we have to remember that this border was formed as a direct result of conquest and the forced annexation of over 525,000 square miles of territory from Mexico. The U.S. seized all of that territory in 1848 after the imposition of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, keeping in mind, of course, the military invasion of Mexico preceding that. This is the history of a lot of nation states' borders. They demarcate territory in ways that are bound up in the workings of empire. The British, the French, the Dutch were all literally creating borders wherever they went in the so-called post-colonial era when borders were imposed by European colonizers. We often naturalize the existence of borders, which removes them from this entanglement with empire. This is why Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz argues that rhetoric like nation of immigrants is a liberal narrative that erases the violence of conquests and borders upon colonized communities. Around the same time, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act was passed, allowing slaveholders to kidnap and capture Black people they claimed had escaped. After the 1848 annexation, slave owners formed militias to patrol the U.S.-Mexico border to prevent Black people from escaping to Mexico. Some of the earliest bordering practices at the U.S.-Mexico border were not only to keep migrants out, at the time mainly Chinese migrants, but were also to keep enslaved Black people in. For Indigenous peoples at this time, immigration and citizenship laws were weapons to further the genocidal elimination of Indigenous political and social formations. The Dawes Act and the Indian Citizenship Act basically imposed U.S. citizenship on Indigenous peoples. A condition of this colonial assimilation was also a capitalist one, was that Indigenous peoples had to agree to live on individual plots of, of land that were carved out from the U.S. government's confiscation, confiscation and partitioning of tribal lands for the settler colonial and capitalist project. Crees, Chippewas, and Yaquis in the United States had to actually launch political battles for tribal recognition after being considered illegal immigrants in the United States. The very category of who was an immigrant and illegal has therefore been essential in forming the settler colonial slaveholding nation state and is the foundation upon which centuries of anti-migrant immigration policies is based upon. These synergies are clear even today in the deployment of the border enforcement teams, not only at the border, but also to train occupation forces in Iraq and Guatemala to repress black uprisings in Portland and indigenous resistance at Standing Rock. Of course, today, indigenous and black peoples from Central America, Mexico, Haiti, the Sahel and Horn regions of Africa disproportionately bear the violence of global displacement and border violence. Borders are therefore a foundationally colonial, anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, and imperialist architecture and must be abolished. Today in the United States, border enforcement must therefore be understood as a bipartisan historical process and not simply one that is about, the, about Donald Trump or the kind of um, aftermath of Donald Trump. This is particularly true in the Biden era because it is precisely under centrist neoliberal rule that we have to be the most vigilant. While former President Donald Trump's overtly malicious policies of separating families, caging children, banning black and brown Muslims, and building the border wall garnered international condemnation, cruel policies of immigration enforcement are a pillar of the Democrats' governance. The rhetoric of productive and legal immigrants with the simultaneous demonization of criminal and illegal immigrants has been the cornerstone of the Democratic Party's immigration platform for three decades. Under Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, an entire immigration enforcement apparatus bent on expanding detention and deportation, criminalizing migration through prosecutions, militarizing the border, and imperialist outsourcing of border enforcement has been cemented. The Clinton years normalized the most severe consequences of border militarization and mass detention. In 1994, as Clinton was signing the North American Free Trade Agreement to ensure the free movement of capital, the Army Corps of Engineers was fencing the border to constrict the movement of the very same people displaced by this latest iteration of neoliberal capitalist warfare. Border Patrol tripled in size to become the second largest enforcement agency at the time. Operations such as Hold the Line in Texas, Gatekeeper in California, and Safeguard in Arizona militarized the border under the official strategy of prevention through deterrence. The doctrine of deterrence requires mass border deaths. 
Within six years of funneling migration towards the more dangerous Sonoran Desert, Arizona uplands, and southern Texas brush, border deaths, what we could more accurately label as premeditated border killings, increased by 509%. Here, I want to just take a moment uh, to talk about the language of border deaths, um, because, you know, the language of border deaths is so incredibly passive. It's a language that suggests that migrants and people on the move, migrants and refugees just happen to die at the border. Um, oftentimes, migrants and refugees are blamed for their own deaths in a very, um, in a narrative of victim blaming that is so deeply similar to rape culture and victim blaming and rape culture narratives. Uh, you know, so oftentimes narratives in neoliberal mainstream media will suggest, you know, why uh, why did migrants decide to go out and and um, go on dangerous treks? Why are they putting their children um, on unsafe boats? Why are they on the move in deserts uh, and in desert terrain during the the summer months? And you know, basically, as if though they're responsible for their own deaths and their own dehydration. Um, and this is you know something that I think we need to squarely challenge, which is why again I say it's more accurate to label border deaths as premeditated premeditated border killings because people don't happen to die on the move. Uh, people are forced into dangerous and precarious journeys that are premeditated border killings. And again, that is the entire rationale of the doctrine of deterrence, right? The entire strategy of prevention through deterrence was and continues to be to cause death, to create killings in order to deter people. Um, and so it is so important to reframe border deaths um, as border killing. President Obama also spent billions of dollars securing the border and border and immigration enforcement under his rule began to outpace the budgets of all other federal law enforcement agencies combined. Obama turbocharged the Secure Communities Initiative until 2014, under which over 1,000 local law enforcement jurisdictions were linked to ICE and FBI databases, nearly doubling deportation rates. By 2014, half of all federal criminal arrests were immigration related. That same year, following a surge of unaccompanied minors at the border, Obama laid the foundation of incarcerating migrant families by detaining them in camps on military bases, which then escalated to forced family separations and hundreds of children who went missing under Trump. In fact, several of the photographs of children in cages that went viral during Trump's presidencies were found to actually have been taken during the Obama years. Obama earned the moniker of deporter in chief for overseeing 3 million deportations, which he accomplished by weaponizing good immigrants versus bad immigrants. Like Clinton, his administration prioritized deporting non-citizens with criminal records. Before introducing his much lauded DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, protections, Obama signaled his intention to increase enforcement against so-called undesirables with the Secure Communities Program. He said, quote, felons, not families, criminals, not children, gang members, not a mom who's working hard to provide for her kids, end quote. Again, I emphasize the ways in which the Democratic Party has continuously used the rhetoric of productive and legal immigrants while demonizing criminal and illegal immigrants under the Biden regime is something we need to be vigilant about. It reminds us that we need to staunchly and squarely reject divisions between so-called good versus bad immigrants as this simply plays into the neoliberal liberal narrative of the Democratic Party. It also reminds us that criminality and illegality are both political constructions invented and policed as race-making and property-protecting regimes. As Ruth Wilson Gilmore teaches us, proving one's innocence or respectability within these constructs is a frustrating and inherently impossible political stance. Innocence is a limiting political stance, stance because criminality and illegality are both, again, political construction. This means that migrant justice movements aligned with abolitionist radical struggles must refuse the liberal lure to endorse categories of desirable or undesirable migrants, must reject assimilation and labor commodification as the price of neoliberal citizenship, and we must challenge state borders as legitimate institutions of governance. Human beings are not illegal, settler colonial states are illegal, and borders must be abolished. Next, I wanna talk about the so-called migration crisis. Um, and, and thinking through, of course, this through an internationalist lens, thinking through this through a lens that is not simply domesticated, 
but to think about what it means in a global sense to talk about the so-called the so-called migration crisis. I would argue that the global migration crisis is more accurately described as a crisis of displacement and immobility. I'm going to talk about language a bit here uh, because I think you know language around similar to border killings that I was just talking about. Language is, of course, such a container for our analysis, for our consciousness, and for our imagination. So I want to uh, spend a little bit of time in thinking about the language that we use when we when we talk about migration. Um, and the first is the the language of migration itself, which is, as I said, something that I think we need to think more clearly as the crisis of displacement and immobility. First on displacement, the total number of migrants worldwide has reached 272 million people, 3.5% of the world's population. An emphasis on displacement rather than migration, I think, forces us to interrogate the root causes of conquest, capitalism, and climate change as the real culprits and drivers of displacement. Palestinians, for example, are considered the world's most protracted refugee population with close to 6 million Palestinians in refugee camps. The so-called Palestinian refugee crisis is inextricable from the ongoing illegal Zionist occupation of Palestine since 1948 and the struggle to free Palestine and for the Palestinian right of return. In the U.S., in the case of the U.S., Hondurans, El Salvadorans, and Guatemalans make up the fastest growing proportion of people crossing into the country today. These perilous migrations are portrayed by liberal media as an over there problem. However, we know these migrations are inextricable from displacements created by U.S. dirty wars backing death squads across Central America and the counterinsurgency terror of the neoliberal war on drugs. There is an unbroken line of U.S. interventions in Central America, an unbroken line of economic imperialism and trade agreements and extraction. Migration is a predictable consequence of these continuous displacements. As Stuart Hall put it, quote, migration is increasingly the joker in the globalization pact, end quote. As such, we can understand migration as both an act of individual self-determination as an, and as an expression of decolonial reparations and redistribution for displacement long overdue. Today, global displacements are escalating, of course, with climate disasters. An estimated one person every two seconds, every two seconds, is being displaced due to a climate catastrophe. By 2050, an estimated 143 million people will be displaced in just three regions of the world, with projections for global climate displacement ranging as high as 1 billion people. Climate change is the single fastest growing form of displacement today, though, of course, completely intertwined and inseparable from the violence of military occupation, land theft, dispossession, resource extraction, capitalist trade agreements, labor exploitation, and so on. In the midst of this climate crisis, displaced refugees who are the least responsible for and have the fewest resources to adapt to climate variations are facing militarized borders in our warming world. A quote from a Pentagon commissioned report where they state, quote, borders will be strengthened around the country to hold back unwanted starving immigrants from the Caribbean islands and especially severe problem, Mexico and South America, end quote. Again, this is a quote from their report. We know that all around the world, not just in the United States, but Australia, Europe and elsewhere, eco-fascist responses to the climate crisis first and foremost, include increasing border militarization with newer and newer, with faster and newer units being um, deployed in order to interdict and intercept climate refugees. All of this is precisely why so many movements say, we are here because you are there. In the face of liberalism that frames conversations around mass displacement, just as one of immigration quotas, legalities, and you know um, the, the domesticated politics of the border itself that I was talking about earlier, it is so important to articulate global migration as an issue, again, of global politics, global displacement, and global immobility. We cannot talk about immigration as a domesticated policy issue without accounting for global asymmetries of power, of capitalism, white supremacy, class, gender, caste, ableism, imperialism, and so on. Le Gillette Noir, a collective of mostly African undocumented migrants in France, assert their presence as an accounting for the exploitation that is a precondition for Europe. 
They boldly pronounce, we are the freedom to move, to settle down, to act. We will take it as our right, end quote. Second, more on language here. Language such as migrant crisis is a pretext to shore up further border securitization and repressive practices of detention and deportation. When the state and mainstream media invoke crisis, border crisis, migrant crisis, swarm crisis, et cetera, caravan crisis, it is not actually to end imperialist drone warfare across borders or fossil fuel extraction across borders. No, the crisis is one of the border where the border is represented as a victim when it is being violated and trespassed by migrants. Constant images and languages of swarms, floods, caravans, invaders all depict and villainize migrants and refugees as the so-called cause of a border crisis, when in fact we know that the crisis is the border itself. It is not a crisis of the border, but due to the border. Despite the constant border panics we're constantly inundated with, over 95% of forcibly displaced people remain internally displaced or in refugee camps in neighboring countries. Hence the necessity to reframe migration as actually a crisis of immobility because people are not actually able to move in the search for safety. Less than 1% of refugees find a permanent home. People are not able to move because border controls, as we know, are deadly. People are being contained at border sites and refugee camps through interdiction, pushbacks, restrictive visa requirements, smart borders, et cetera. So reframing the migration crisis as one of displacement and also of immobility illuminates that most migrants are forcibly displaced and systematically immobilized. Displacement and immobility then, not free movement, is the reality of racial imperial management in our contemporary era. In this sense, borders are carceral regimes. Police, prisons, and borders all operate by immobilizing people. Notably, the word mob, a criminalizing vocabulary used to link large groups of poor racialized people to social disorder in inner cities and at the border, derives from the word mobility. There is no crisis of migration. Rather, there is a relentless crisis of displacement and immobility within and across nation state borders. Mapping who is most vulnerable to dispossession and displacement, again, within or across nation state borders, reveals the fault lines between rich and poor, between whiteness and its black, indigenous and racialized other. The border, the prison, the sweatshop floor, the refugee camp, the reservation, the gentrified gated community are all part of the same carceral system, the same bordering system, operating through dispossession, capture, containment, and immobility. All bordering regimes are intended to enforce harmful, powerful, harmful power relations and destroy communal social organization. These bordering regimes, or we could say ordering regimes, or we could say carceral regimes, simultaneously manufacture and discipline surplus populations under capitalism and colonialism, while parasitically extracting land, labor, and life itself. Angela Davis and Gina Dent have written, quote, we continue to find that the prison is itself a border. We continue to find that the prison is itself a border. Drawing from Davis and Dent, the prison is a border and the border is a prison. Fourth, most ironically and offensively in this conversation around language is that the migration crisis is declared a new crisis with Western countries primarily positioned as its victims, even though for four centuries, nearly 80 million Europeans became settler colonists across the Americas and Oceania, while 4 million indentured laborers from Asia were scattered across the globe and the transatlantic slave trade kidnapped and enslaved 15 million Africans. Colonialism, genocide, slavery, and indentureship are not only completely erased as continuities of violence and contemporary invocations of a so-called migration crisis, but are also the very conditions of possibility for the border itself. Related to this, and this is again a bit more on semantics, is questioning who is even considered a migrant within the narrative of migration crisis. Classifications such as migrant or refugee do not represent unified social groups as much as they symbolize state-regulated relations of difference and state-manufactured conditions of vulnerability. There are actually millions of people on the move today. In fact, we move with much more mobility than we ever have today. Most people who are not immobilized are those who can travel as investors, bankers, expats, diplomats, hipsters, tourists, People literally, you know, literally Columbusing and Airbnb-ing all around the world. 
getting on airplanes, getting on cruises, that kind of movement is not surveilled or scapegoated. That kind of movement is not what we're talking about when we think about who is a migrant or a refugee. In fact, under our system of colonialism and capitalism, that kind of movement is celebrated. Urban renewal or gentrification, for example, basically self-advertises as the new colonial pioneers. Gentrification, a bordering, ordering system, usurping land and property that is viciously enforced through policing and displacement of homeless and houseless encampments is, of course, a bordering regime. So when we say migration crisis, we aren't actually talking about all kinds of movement or anyone on the move. Rather, we're talking about specifically displaced and immobilized people on the other side of whiteness and capital and empire who are being dehumanized, who are being contained, and who are being surveillanced and captured by carceral systems and borders. While the rich from wealthy states routinely enjoy borderless mobility around the world, the world's majority of racialized poor people are subjected to criminalization, illegalization, immobility, and premature death. In fact, embedded in the language of migration crisis is the anti-Black idea of a certain kind of inherently undesirable movement, unregulated and ungovernable. The sustained capture and punishment of Black mobility, the racialization of Muslim people, the genocidal corralling of Indigenous people onto reservations, the violent transformation of non-capitalist land stewardship into private property, the dispossession of millions into caste-oppressed indentured labor, and the deliberate cleaving and creation of so-called post-colonial Western nation states are all bordering regimes that are constitutive of the global policing of migration today, which is precisely why what we know of as the kind of domesticated politics of immigration and borders must again be placed within globalized asymmetries of power. Border imperialism creates mass displacement and mass immobility. Next, I wanna talk about the border and where and how it exists. Contrary to how we think about borders, I hope what I'm making clear here is that the border is not a fixed line that simply demarcates territory. Borders are actually better understood as bordering regimes that are productive regimes firmly embedded in global imperialism. And also importantly, global controls and border controls exist far beyond the territorial border itself. The, put another way, the border is elastic and the magical line can exist anywhere. It can exist far within and far beyond the border. I want to start by thinking about how the border exists beyond the border, and that is through border outsourcing. Border outsourcing, I would argue, is one of the key methods of imperialism in our contemporary era. Yet this analysis of borders frequently misses the mark when it comes to thinking about border outsourcing. We need to, I would argue, squarely locate the border is primarily and increasingly so functioning as an outsourced regime. I would also argue that many of our present day analysis of imperialism has largely ignored the, inter the entanglements with, um, with bordering and bordering regimes. And so often we tend to get stuck in debates about whether or not we still live in a world marked by imperialism um, by, and we get stuck in an analysis of border enforcement that is confined by what is happening at state borders. But I think when we think about border outsourcing, both of those kinds of questions or debates about imperialism and the nature of the border um, get illuminated furthermore. The outsourcing of border controls is increasingly, I would argue, a method of maintaining imperial superpower in the world today, especially so for the US, Canada, Israel, India, Australia, New Zealand, UK, Western and Central EU countries. Imperialism is of course, as I've just discussed, already a root cause of global migration, but increasingly today, the management of global migration through border outsourcing is becoming a central method of preserving imperial relations. For example, while Biden can claim he won't build Trump's border wall, he's effectively creating a fortress far beyond the side of the US-Mexico border itself to stop migrants and refugees well before they even reach the border. Bordering regimes are increasingly layered with controls beyond nation states' territorial limits. U.S., Australian, and European subordination of Central America, Oceania, Africa, and the Middle East compels countries in these regions to accept border checkpoints, drone surveillance, offshore detention, and migration prevention and interception campaigns as conditions of trade and aid agreements. We have to understand how critical immigration-related diplomacy is to current global relations. For example, Nairu, formerly under Australian administrative and trusteeship until 1968, 
and devastated through centuries of resource colonialism, has now become Australia's dumping ground for refugees. When Australia started offshoring refugee detention to Nairu over 20 years ago, it increased aid to Nairu amounting to one third of the country's GDP. Nairu, Libya, Mali, Mexico, Niger, Papua New Guinea, Rwanda, which has been in the news a lot recently due to its deal with the UK and the EU, Turkey, Sudan are all becoming the new frontiers of border militarization. The outsourcing of border controls is becoming a means of managing global migration by globalizing the violence of borders and maintaining a colonial present. In the US, the outsourcing of border violence is becoming an additional means of preserving imperial relations with Mexico and Central America. Initiated by Bush and expanded, and expanded under Obama and Biden, the multi-billion dollar US-Mexico Merida Initiative provides funding for a battery of police and migration checkpoints beginning in Southern Chiapas and ending at the border. The U.S. also funds immigration enforcement in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, and Mexico to stop people well before they even reach the U.S.-Mexico border. The Central American Regional Security Initiative paramilitarizes the entire landscape through the triad of the war on drugs, the war on indigenous lands, and the war on migrants. Shorter, shortly after the U.S. launched the Mexico-Guatemala-Belize border region program, Homeland Security officials declared that, quote, the Guatemalan border with Chiapas is now our southern border. So we see this kind of pattern uh, repeated around the world, of course, at the borders of the EU. And this really reinforces the point that the border exists everywhere and that border outsourcing makes it such that global violence of borders is outsourced and literally exists everywhere. The next thing that I want to talk about in brief is the ways in which the border exists internally, if you will, in sourcing of borders, the flip side of border outsourcing. And that is that border enforcement is a key pillar of racial capitalism. Border enforcement is not only about the terror of outright exclusion and expulsion, but borders are also intended to create conditions of deportability, which produce immense precarity. Workers' labor power is captured by the border and this pliable labor is exploited by the employer. People may recall that after its formal inception in 1924, U.S. Border Patrol was actually overseen by the Department of Labor for decades. We know that the racial expropriation of land, labor, and life is innate to capitalism thanks to immense uh, scholarship by Black abolitionist scholars, Black Marxist scholars like Robin Kelly, Cedric Robinson, and so many others in their theorizing of racial capitalism, which is to say that capitalism relies on, requires, and reproduces racial hierarchies, and that the border, I would argue, is central to this process. Capitalism requires labor to be constantly segmented, and the border acts as a spatial fix for capitalism by bifurcating the global labor force. Border controls manufacture spatial difference not to completely exclude all people, but to capitalize on them. So we know, for example, that in 2019, when 680 workers at processing plants in Mississippi were raided in an ICE raid, that happened shortly after a high-profile unionization drive. So again, while far-right movements are immigration exclusionists driven by xenophobic and restrictionist ideology, the reality is that anti-immigrant backlash is not intended to exclude all migrants, but rather to make the condition of migration, including the condition of migrant labor, more precarious. While workers are declared illegal, the surplus value they create is never deemed illegal. The lack of full immigration status and the tying of visa status to an employer are key to creating pools of cheapened indentured laborers. We see this today. Uh, with all of what's happening with H-1 visas, with Twitter and farm work, agricultural work, the nature of indentured work is to use the tying of one's visa status to their employer to create pools of precarious labor. These deportable workers who are indentured to their employer are often also spatially and socially segregated, literally housed in separate labor camps, unprotected by national labor laws or unionization, unable to fully access public services and unable to bring their families with them. Labor migration shapes and sustains capital and state's ability to coerce labor and manage citizenship. 
the designation of migrant workers, of foreign workers, of temporary workers, all of these kinds of labels create a material and ideological differentiation that further affixes race to citizenship. I would argue that such labels are essentially a euphemism for third world workers and jobs such as farm work and domestic work that cannot be outsourced to the periphery are being insourced through migrant work, where again, the border acts as a spatial fix for capitalism. In this way, insourced to labor from labor migration programs and outsourced labor in free trade zones represent two sides of the same coin, deliberately deflated labor and political power. It is crucial to understand that the border actually works in the interests of capital and not against it. This is especially important because there are many on the left who believe that somehow more border enforcement is better for citizen workers. I would argue that they are misdirected. In their formulation, migrant workers are essentially scab workers who are lowering the wage floor and stealing jobs from citizens. But migrant workers do not suppress wages, bosses and borders do. Free capital requires immobilized labor, which is precisely what the border produces, and which is why it is so important to reframe the border as a bordering regime that creates immobility, because what immobility creates is precarious labor. We must refuse the ruling class attempts to pit workers against migrants, because not only is it racist, but also for migrants to be successfully pitted against workers presupposes that migrants are not also workers participating in and leading class struggles. We must remember that no worker is illegal and the only way to fight back against the cheapening of labor is to engage in an internationalist fight against racist citizenship and racial capitalism. I wanna end by thinking through what is a no borders world and what does a no, border, no borders world mean for transnational solidarity? I wanna start with the words of Toni Morrison, who in her prophetic work, Home, described, quote, the contemporary world's work has become policing, halting, forming policy regarding and trying to administer the movement of people, end quote. We are witness to the horrific impacts of this constant categorization and control of people suffocation in cargo trucks, dehydration in blistering heat, unmarked graves in deserts, lethal pushbacks of migrant caravans, and wet cemeteries are the daily deathscape of those killed by borders. To be a modern liberal nation state in a state-centric world presupposes the existence of a secured border. So what would a no borders world look like? First, the necessity of a no borders world. Given the violent deathscape for literally millions of people around the world, I would argue that there is no other alternative than to fight for a world without borders. So we ask ourselves, what even is the function of borders today? Borders maintain asymmetric relations of wealth accrued from colonial impoverishment of a system that grants mobility for some, but mass immobility and containment for most essentially a divided working class and system of global apartheid determining who can live where and under what conditions. Border policies cannot be tweaked or reformed. They must be dismantled if we believe in justice at a planetary scale. Real advocates of internationalism cannot accept the lingering, a lingering reality of the global South, which continues to exist in large part because of the continued differentiation of borders. A world without borders is not the same as a world with open borders. I would stress that in an open borders world, the world stays configured the way it currently is, with massive inequality, massive displacement, continued hierarchical differentiation, except borders are opened up, right? This is um, a libertarian idea of an open borders world. But if people are still being displaced, are being displaced and forced from their lands, and some parts of the world are still being plundered and treated as sacrifice zones, for the centers of power, there is of course no justice in that. Oh, no, borders politics is far more expansive than the site of the border itself, because of course the border is more than the site of the border. So thinking as part of and alongside movements and organizations like Le Gillette Noir, Mi Gente, No One Is Legal, the Saw Papier Movement, Red Nation, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and so many more, we see that a no borders politics is actually about dismantling 
all bordering regimes, which is to say dismantling all ordering regimes, which is to say all carceral regimes, which is to say all exploitative reg regimes. Like the regime of private property, borders are not simply lines marking territory, they are shaped by and shape social relations. The border reproduces a colonial racial social order, fortifies the rich against the rest, deflates labor power, treats land as a possession, and is the ideological basis for all repressive immigration policies. So to live in a world without borders is not only to struggle for the rights of refugees and immigrants, but it it is to fight for freedom for all against displacement and immobility. It is to fight for liberation so that everyone has a home and where we are all able to live freely in our neighborhoods, our lands, our homes, and in relationship and kinship with one another. It is a freedom, it is a part of the freedom fights against gentrification, against colonialism and occupation. It is parts of the fight to be free from policing and cages and bosses and banks. It is part of the dreams articulated by queer and trans and feminist and disability justice movements of being at home in our bodies. And part, of course, of fights for climate justice to ensure that we have a habitable earth for all living creature. While it may seem contradictory, a no borders world includes the freedom to stay and the freedom to move, meaning that no one should be forcibly displaced from their homes and lands and that people should have the freedom to move with safety and dignity. These may seem contradictory, but there are necessary corollaries. The freedom to move and the freedom to stay, which is to say no borders, is reparations and redistribution long due. It means an end to all detention and deportation. It means full immigration status for all migrants. It means demilitarization. It means land back. It means abolition of police and prisons. It means dismantling of capitalism. And it means collective liberation for all. Thinking of world making as homemaking is so important in the midst of all of the overlapping crises that we are in the middle of today. The crux of a no border politics is nestled in the broader politics of home. How do we create a world where we all have a home, where we can all claim home, where we are all at home in our bodies, where the earth is cared for as a home and where non-human beings also have a home. I close with the words of Eduardo Galeano who said, the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The world was born yearning to be a home for everyone and a no border politics, which is to say a world with no borders, means that we fight for a world where everyone has a home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harsha. That was absolutely fantastic. Everyone, I uh, welcome you to join with me in uh, giving Harsha a round of applause. And I will also explain to you um, how we will continue um, today's event. We're going to turn to Q&A now. Uh, there are two ways you can ask a question. One, you can raise your hand by navigating to the reactions button at the bottom of the screen um, and, and click the icon, and I will call on your name. Or uh, you are welcome to type your question into the chat, and I will read it out for you. I will be taking questions in groups of three. If I do call on you, please turn your camera on so we can see you so you can ask your question. The floor is open. Isabel Anadon, you are welcome to ask your question. First of all, um, thank you so much, um, Harsha, for this amazing talk. I um, think it's it was great and covered and spanned, um, a, you know, historical but also contemporary issues around border enforcement. So I really appreciated that. Um, my question is really focused on um, the little bit that you talked about in terms of outsourcing of border enforcement. Um, you spoke a lot about how outsourcing now um, is really concentrated in managing migration um, from uh, the South, right? So working most closely with these border nations such as Morocco, um, North Africa, and but also um, Mexico to really prevent migration and uh, providing funds and training and supports to manage that. <clears throat> Um, I'm, I'm also curious about your thoughts um, and, you know, you provide excellent uh, content internationally, both historically around uh, the privatiz privatization of border enforcement, both um, kind of within countries themselves. So in Europe, in Canada, excuse me, and um, in the United States around um, privatization specifically of enforcement. And so I'm just curious to hear more thoughts that you have about, about that. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in learning more about your thoughts around private corporations, the GEO group, CCA, 
um, this connection with private prison building, stuff like this. Thanks, Isabel. Anyone else have a question for Harsha? Harsha, while people work up the courage to ask you a question after an absolutely powerful talk, I invite you to respond to Isabel. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I also welcome any heckling comments too. I'm, I'm very happy for any critique uh, as well or comments that are not questions. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. In terms of um, outsourcing, I mean, border outsourcing is increasingly um, a growing market for the border security industry. Um, TNI, the Transnational Institute, has an incredible report. I would encourage people to check out if you haven't seen it, where they look at the linkages uh, between border outsourcing and um, you know very particular corporations that, that are benefiting from from border outsourcing. So looking at the ways in which um, you know detention practices, for example, are being outsourced, and and the same kind of corporations that benefit from the buildup of immigration detention and prison detention um, and prison incarceration, for example, in the United States and Europe are now also benefiting from expanding contracts um, around the world, uh, like in Mexico and Central America in the Sahel region of Africa. So I would encourage people to check that report out. Um, and the other piece that I would add there, of course, is that you know the privatization, it's so important when we're thinking about the, prof the profit motive and targeting corporations that we also always connect that to state violence, that it is only made possible um, through the state border, through multinational agreements that even allow outsourcing to happen. Um, and so that's that connective part, right? Because of course, one of the lessons that we learn uh, from abolitionist struggle is that it's important not only to say fight private prisons, but to recognize that incarceration as a system as a whole is deeply flawed. And of course, in many countries, like where I live in Canada, uh, the immigration detention industry is largely actually a, a non-privatized one. It's it's largely a, it's a largely still a state infrastructure, um, and that's true for some countries in the EU, EU as well. Um, so while we hold an analysis of the private profiteers that are making a killing um, out of uh, detention and the globalization increasingly of detention, that we also squarely locate the state as culpable within that violence. Uh, but there are, you know, there that globalization of that violence, there's so many linkages, right? Like Elbit, for example, um, is an Israel, one of the world's kind of premier, known as one of the world's premier security companies. Um, and Elbit has provided security and continues to provide security and is responsible for, bu for building the Israeli apartheid wall through Palestine, also provides security at the U.S.-Mexico border, is responsible for surveillance cameras, in some of the most militarized communities amongst border towns, like the Chidoni Odom, um, who are fighting border securitization. And also Elbit is in now increasingly uh, seeking um, partnerships in Mexico in order to work with the United States government to build detention infrastructure there. So uh, certainly following the money is one of the ways in which we can map out the ways in which um, violence is, is being globalized. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Harsha. So we now have a panoply of questions. I will take one from the chat first, and then I'll call on two folks with their hands raised. The first question is from Nick Borders. He writes, a thread that unravels the nightmare history of capital and its ongoing robbery of land and labor in the carceral re regime. Are borders also a vulnerability for capital, given that they are politically used to mobilize us versus them fear politics? Thank you, Nick. And uh, Samira, I'm going to call on you. Um, please turn on your camera and ask your question. Hi, um, I'm on the bus, speaking of mobility, so I'm not able to turn on my camera right now. <laughs> um, but I did have a um, question for Harsha, um, specifically in terms of scale, because um, in your last book, you have this like very lovely sweeping history um, and overview of how this global border regime and logics work in all these different spaces in kind of similar ways. And I'm trying to think, uh, work through in my own work that looks at kind of the history of border externalization and migration regimes in, in Turkey and, tr and trying to really find that balance between kind of these global overviews um, of how these systems and structures work while also not losing that local context in history and not getting too kind of buried in the details and so I was curious if you had any thoughts or approaches to how you strike that balance in your own work. Thank you so much for a, a wonderful talk. Thank you, Samira. That was wonderful. And now, Alicia, I ask you to turn on your camera, if you're able, and ask your question. 
Hi. Um, well, thank you for an amazing talk. Um, I was very, very excited to hear you. Uh, I am actually uh, right now located in Chiapas, Mexico, where the whole place is a new border. <laughs> um, like you can see the border in regime all around. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about citizenship and how the notions of citizenship uh, around the state are helping these bordering regimes. And um, if you could talk about, based on your experience, about like what other notions of belonging could be helpful in a non no border world. Harsha, it's all yours. Um, thank you for those wonderful comments and, and questions. Um, if I understood that the question, the first one, um, correctly in terms of our borders, also vulnerability for capital, I feel, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it may be related to the next question that's hat two, which is that corporations have been borderless in promoting global capitalism. Um, I mean, I think, I hope what I make clear, maybe I wasn't so clear, is that, you know, one of the ways in which the left articulates itself is that capital doesn't want borders, therefore the left should want borders. Like it's the flip side of that argument. Um, but what I would argue is that the fact that borders are borderless for capital and that borders exist for labor is precisely the seeming contradiction uh, that is actually not a, is not a contradiction. It is the necessary juxtaposition, right? Which is that in order for capital to move freely across borders, it requires bordered labor. Um, and so it is, um, I think, a misinterpretation and a misread on some parts of the left that think that the ways in which we fight capital is by calling for more border enforcement, because all that it does is that that actually creates a divided working class and a divided labor force, right? That's that's actually how the border works. Um, and of course, it's um, of course capital moves freely, and, and capital requires labor to not move freely. Um, but that's why no borders world is actually about dismantling capitalism, right? It's not just about the side of the border and everybody moving freely. It is actually about dismantling capitalism and colonialism, such that those distinctions. Um, become uh, become collapsed and become obsolete. And of course, if we were you know really Marxist about it, we would recall that Marx believed that in order to live, you know that a, that a revolutionary society would be classless and and arguably also stateless. Um, and so I think that is uh, the 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 seeming um, a discomfort with that the left has around the border that we need to uh, actively think about. Uh, and think about what work the border actually does. Um, and so a bo in a borderless world, we would actually be talking also about a non-capitalist world, right? Uh, in terms of this question of the local and global and scale, thank you so much for that. Um, my work is, I'm not an academic, so I don't know how much this, this makes any sense, but um, as someone who comes to this work primarily as a, a movement organizer, uh, most of my organizing has been deeply local. Um, you know, in terms of laws and policies and campaigns that are so local and so jurisdictional based that I found it necessary in my organizing to think about larger scales in order to make sense, right? In order to not exceptionalize what was happening, in order to try to make sense of bordering regimes, not in a way that collapsed, but in a way that allowed for movement solidarity across movements, right? To build alliances to build alliances with movements in the United States, to build alliances with movements in Europe, you know, in other parts of the world. Um, so part of that was um, not as much approaching this through uh, a scholarly lens, but trying to be expansive in making alliances through a movement lens, if that makes sense. So that was um, that was that was what motivated the work, um, and so that informed the the direction that the work went. The first book that I wrote is, is deeply um, local in that it looks at one movement in, in the Canadian context. Um, and this book was different because part of what happened with the first book was that I was meeting so many people and people you know, in other parts of the world and people kept saying, oh, but Canada's so much better. I'm like, that makes no sense. It's like I organize in Canada. I know it's not much better. So what are ways in which we can you know, not 
um, think about where it's better or worse, but what are synergies that allow us to organize together um, in solidarity and in relationship to one another? Um, and then the question about um, the new border at Chiapas, thank you so much for that and ways in which we can rethink citizenship. Um, of, of course, I'd have to say, I don't think there's one, one answer, um, but I do think that citizenship in the ways that we know it is completely activated through the border. It's impossible to think about it outside of bordering regimes. Um, but I can maybe provide one example, uh, which is, you know, one of the communities that I work closely with is an indigenous community, um, the Wet'suwet'en Nation. And they've been fighting pipelines for a really long time. People may be familiar with their struggle, but you know, when you enter their territory, you get asked a series of questions that follows um, free prior and informed consent protocols, right? That is along the lines of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And you're asked a series of questions that is, you know, what's your intention in coming here? Do you work for the state or for industry? And how will your visit um, enact reciprocity and benefit to the people and the land to which you come? And for me, that's an incredibly beautiful notion of citizenship, right? I want to be clear that to me, that's not the same as a border at all. To me, that is actually land stewardship that's commoning, that's thinking about common purpose. It's actually contrary to the state and carceral regimes. In fact, if you are part of the state or the government or, or corporate industry, um, you know, that's dealt with separately, right? Like the, the idea is that if you are not those uh, institutions, then you are welcome. And so to me, that's an incredible counter way to think about how we um, build together, right? How do we build different ways of what relationality might mean um, that is place-based, that is based in ecological stewardship, uh, but again, I'm not trying to be prescriptive. That's just one example. But I think, you know, so many different communities are thinking about belonging in expansive ways, are thinking about kinship in expansive ways. Uh, you know, inner cities are constantly remaking what it means to be a neighbor, right? They're in the best sense of the word, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual, um, you know, working class communities defending their communities against gentrification, those are also ideas of citizenship um, that go beyond idea, you know, that is not just about diaspora, that actually is about remaking citizenship as kinship. Um, and so to me, citizenship as a verb is something that is not uh, determined or decreed by the state, but is constantly made. And one of the places where it's made is through struggle, right? Every time social movements um, are organizing, um, are, you know, whether it's a houseless encampment, whether it's a squat, whether it's a, a border campsite, those are all ways of redefining citizenship. And I do not underestimate the ways in which they act. They may seem micro in scale, but I think the ways in which we remake and relearn what it means to be human through struggle um, is so deeply profound. Thank you very much for that, Harsha. First, I'll turn to a question from Roman in the chat. What do you see as the mechanisms for making borders open in the broad sense you describe? Electoral politics, activism, revolutions, other? So that's one question. And then I'm going to turn to Nancy, who I'm going to ask to turn on your camera, Nancy, if you are able and ask your question. Hi. Hi. Yes, I, I am. Um, um, thank, thank you so much, Asha. That is really great. And your work is fantastic. Um, I'm in Harare. That's why it's dark. Um, so <laughs> I, the, it, it, the, the thing I was thinking about is, you know, based in Africa with the, you know, so the question of borders is really a, a big, a big topic in a sort of imaginary way because of the way borders were created in Africa um, and the Berlin conference and all of that. So it's one of those things. And the whole Pan-African idea was that, you know, we can sort of Africa unite. Um, but of course, the, the, I, I guess the, the touching colonial borders was seen as too much of a hot potato um, for anybody to, for, for, um, states to deal with. I mean, there are various debates about that, but it was like, let's just keep the borders as they are with all the problems that has engendered um, <clears throat> along the way. Um, so I think there's, uh, but 
and, and one of the things I'm very appreciative about, um, about your presentation and the discussion and the work that's being done, which is quite new for me, is, is that it really offers us a, a possibility to think, think, think um, where we were stuck. So what do we do about these borders um, of, of actually thinking about, you know, um, a, a, you know, what does it really mean to have these borders, border regimes, it's, and, and, and getting rid of borders as part of the bigger Pan-African decolonization project. So I, it really opens up a space uh, possible for discussion um, at, in, a, in, a, in an African context. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, we are, we are stuck to borders, like, you know, we, we can't, uh, we're like, so then we need something in its place, right? Because <laughs> we're so, we're so like, we need something there, right? We can't just get rid of them. Um, there has to be something that provides whatever we think borders provide us with. Um, so just, uh, I, I guess it was just a, 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 the question is more around like, you know, how, how do we, um, moving from these discussions, um, if you are able uh, um, to do so, um, to to think about so what is what how what is what is the imaginary and how do we sort of argue a case for then saying we could dismantle these borders? Um, it's something that we all want to do. Um, we all know that, uh, like for for women, for example, cross the cross border trade is a very typical African. Um, uh, um, um, image of women who are crossing borders all the time for trade, um, informal cross-border traders. Um, and, but so there's there's definitely an idea, and when people want an African passport. Question is like, how do we push to the next level in terms of creating that new idea and overcoming some of these other, um, I suppose concerns, if you can call them, or fears of letting go. So I think the problem is how do, how do we let go of something? And it's, it feels a bit like a jump into the unknown, however desirable or undesirable the current situation is. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you also for joining all the way from Zimbabwe. Um, there are no other questions right now. Harsha, please feel free to answer. Thank you for both of those um, questions and thank you for joining. Um, Oh, maybe I'll just go in reverse chronological order because uh, the other one's written, so I don't want to forget this one. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think uh, off the top of my head, and please others feel free to contribute to the conversation. I'd love to hear from more people. Um, I think one is absolutely, I don't underestimate the crisis, as, as you mentioned, of our imagination, right? Like we hold on to borders uh, so intensely in the same way that we hold on to prisons and we hold on to police, right? It becomes, uh, as abolitionists teach us, it becomes a standall for all the kind of social problems. Um, and so borders become a standall for the kinds of ways in which we understand austerity. It becomes a stand-in for the ways in which we understand capitalism, uh, labor, racism, you know, global politics, global relations, et cetera. So borders becomes a literal stand-in for the floodgates of all of what this represents. Um, and so I think, you know, first, just even unpacking what borders do, how they function, what they're meant to do in our crisis of the imagination is such a, a key thing for me. Because when we do ask people, why do you hold on to borders? A lot of it is just the idea of fear of other people, right? Like that's literally what it comes down to. Fear that other people take jobs, resources, cult, you know, all of those, those are not just far right um, talking points, you know, it also exists in the left, it exists in the liberal left, um, in, in the kind of big tent labor left, it's the fear that somehow immigrants will take jobs without ever thinking about what is, what is the ways in which social democratic states have, you know, built up their economies, etc. So uh, I think that's a huge piece of the work of undoing borders is the psychic, psychological, political consciousness work of um, what do borders protect and what kinds of privilege do they protect? Um, the other ways in which I think more concretely, perhaps materially, that we can work to undo borders is just, in, you know, there's so many grassroots campaigns and grassroots mobilizing that work to support migrants and refugees um, that are expansive and that I think do the work of rendering the border obsolete. So, for example, around the world, campaigns that argue for status for all people, like where I'm based in Canada, the Migrant Rights Network has a platform 
that is migrant, that is st immigration status for all people, which is to say, you know, um, there isn't a division between so-called good versus bad immigrants, which is to say no detentions and no, de do, no deportation. Um, so now while, of course, that doesn't undo the mass system of displacement and immobility that borders engender, um, in our kind of local terrain, when we say status for all, that is a call to say that we stand with all people on the move, right? It is to refuse those kinds of division. Um, similarly, campaigns that call for, you know, no detentions, no deportations, those are very practical ways in which the logic of the border gets undone, right? Because if you say no detentions and no deportations, then again, that's advocating um, for in favor of, of mobility and against immobility, right? And against the logic of those bordering regimes. So um, I think in a, in a material way, um, supporting migrant justice campaigns that are organizing in those expansive ways and those, you know, that are as abolitionists would say alongside, alongside or along the lines of non-reformist reforms, right? Rather than reformist reforms. Those are the kinds of movements um, that make the border obsolete. And the last thing that I would say is that it is so important to understand for all of us, and we understand, I just mean in our work, and how we convey it, that um, migrant justice work is also anti-war work. It is also anti-gentrification work. It is also anti-capitalist work. It is also work against trade agreements because that is exactly what borders uphold, right? So it is not separate to say that when we fight against war and occupation, then we are not fighting for migrant justice because fighting against forced displacement is also part of the fight. Um, and again, borders uphold that crisis of displacement and immobility. So all of those things together, um, I think, are ways in which we can continue to be more imaginative and um, really break the stronghold of what borders are and how they function um, in very kind of concrete ways. I hope that answers your question, but I think that, that that's part of it. Um, and in terms of this, I mean, it's kind of related to this question about um, how do we do this work, right? Is it electoral politics, activism, revolution, or the other? I mean, I think it's all of it. I'm someone who's an organizer primarily, so I very um, vehemently believe in the necessity of struggle. Um, I don't think that there is any hope without struggle. And though, you know, struggle brings no guarantees, it brings possibility. Um, and I think also that we all have a role in the ecosystem of struggle. And I think that all, all forms of struggle have a role. And so I do believe that there is um, a role for all of it. There's a role for radical imagination. There is a, a role for organizing in very concrete ways. Um, there is a ways in which those merge. There's a way in which it may, you know, that it converges with electoral organizing, which is electoral organizing that may look like, you know, um, organizing and in one's jurisdiction to fight against detention or deportation or fight as we do here um, for a regularization program, which is, you know, an amnesty program with no exceptions and no eligibility criteria. Those are all strategic kind of tactical questions. Um, and I think there's there's room for all of it, but I, I do very much believe uh, that while a no borders politic may seem utopian and may seem futuristic, there are so many people organizing and fighting and literally people on the move. The very act of being on the move is a defiance of the border every single day. And I don't think that we have any other option because the, the kind of current day reality is a deathscape. It's a literal deathscape. And so the only option we have is, is to fight for a world with no borders. Um, both in the futurist sense, but also in the present day practical politics of what it means to render the border obsolete. Thank you very much, Harsha. We still have a few more minutes for some questions um, for folks who have not asked one yet. So I invite anyone who has not yet asked a question or offered up a comment to please do so at this time. Um, thank you so much for your um, for your talk. And I... Um, I was wondering if you could speak about the situation um, in Haiti and the conversations that are happening in the U.S. about whether or not to intervene. Um, so I was reading in the paper this morning a quotation from a person who used to be an envoy for the U.S. government to Haiti saying that um, 
the U.S. government's biggest Haitian nightmare is a mass migration event. And um, that just, uh, that the biggest nightmare wouldn't be uh, people dying. It just like absolutely devastating of a, of a, um, a statement. He was being critical in that statement. Um, but so I, it seems like a, um, a prime example of what you're talking about in terms of the relationships between um, imp imperialism and militarization, imperialism in terms of border outsourcing, um, et cetera. So. Thanks, Jenna. I feel like you could speak to this better than I could and perhaps others too, and especially given your work. Um, your very important work, um, you know, and I will say I'm also in the in the Canadian context, um, and you know, Canada was not a junior partner but an active partner when it came to the coup in 2004 in Haiti, um, and that's important for me to state given where I am and where I'm located, because oftentimes again, you know, Canada gets perceived as as not so bad, et cetera, but really. Um, Canada has been the pioneer, literally, of the responsibility to protect doctrine at the United Nations, which has been behind many of these um, imperialist interventions of late that uh, aim to give imperialism a humanitarian veneer. Um, and so, you know, uh, Canada has been championing responsibility to protect with, of course, the United States and France and NATO allies. Um, so much of uh, the Haitian so-called migration crisis um, as we know, and Jenna, your work outlines, you know, is a, is a long trajectory that's rooted in the very particular, unique history of uh, Haiti as the first independent Black Republic. Um, also, the really specific history of the maritime border with the United States, right? Um, the buildup of America's detention system is completely bound up at the maritime border, more so than the land border, uh, which we know from your work. Um, and you know, also the ways in which increasingly with the climate crisis, marine interdiction is bound up in, in ways in which fighting migration has become a reason for interdiction, right? So border securitization has become both the cause and the effect of what it means to talk about the migration crisis rather than the root causes of displacement. Um, and I think that's also true in Central America when Biden came out and said, you know, we want to stop we don't, we don't want people to move. We want to ensure that people have prosperity. But I think we can also trace that back to NAFTA, right? That was the very same logic of NAFTA. NAFTA was actually, when it was first signed, one of the rationales that was given for the signing of NAFTA was that this would allow Mexicans to stay in Mexico, even though, of course, everybody warned that that would not be the case, right? That it would lead to mass impoverishment. So um, there's a cyclical relationship between not only imperialism and intervention and the mass displacement and instability that that causes, but also a cyclical logic in how governments um, argue and provide rationale for intervention. And increasingly, one of the rationales for intervention is in order to deter migration, when in fact, we know but, you know, it both reveals, like you said, their lack of care for what is actually happening to people, um, but also reveals the illogical nature of that argument because intervention actually leads to more migration. Um, and one of the parallels we see with that right now clearly is climate change. You know, one of the sole reasons that in all the kind of COP talks that happen, one of the sole motivators for the richest states to finally take climate change, you know, they don't take it seriously, but to even give it lip service is actually climate displacement, right? Because they don't actually want people displaced, not because they care about climate change, but because they don't want a crisis or what they view as a new crisis in migration. So um, there's there's a feedback loop um, around imperialism and intervention and displacement and migration that is endless. On that note, we're at 1.26 US Central Time. So I think we will leave it there for today. Again, on behalf of the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice, the Department of Geography, and the Institution, Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center here at UW-Madison, I'd really like to thank Harsha Walia for her truly mm -hmm. powerful talk today and a wonderful conversation afterwards. We really appreciate your time. And for all of you as members of our audience, we, of course, appreciate you as well. We hope to see you um, in the new year.
Until then, take care and be well. Thank you. Thank you.